a very good evening everyone so it is 6:30 so uh, we will start now so uh, i just started facebook live and uh, you those who who are here uh, they can intimate their friends those uh, who didn't join yet so you can just uh, give them a message or uh, something uh, you can spread the word about the uh, meeting you can share the link with them so very good evening those who are just joining uh, uh, i welcome you all uh, so you all as you all know uh, from the past 2 3 weeks we have started this final revision sessions and uh, with uh, we have done uh, the final revision of F frm aem processing so today we'll uh, uh, we'll do the final revision session for aquaculture and genetics hopefully tomorrow we'll do for uh, pathology and yeah we'll start uh, we'll start with the session so today uh, Uh, i would like uh, i would like to uh, inform you all so today we have uh, two wonderful uh, seniors means they are my uh, seniors so they are very uh, confident speakers they are orators uh, uh, i uh, means uh, in say if you you will see uh, them wherever the meetings or any uh, programs uh, will be there they will be the anchors they are very confident they are very efficient speakers orators at the same time uh, they have very high uh, academic background and i won't uh, 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 dig more about uh, their academic achievements or anything so without delay uh, i would like to welcome i would love to welcome uh, soumya pande ma'am uh, so uh, she is uh, she is my senior uh, she is currently she is pursuing her phd in uh, fish genetics and breeding department in cafe she has uh, did her masters in cafe itself and uh, she is an efficient speaker she is a orator uh, uh, she is very <laughs> she is very good at teaching uh, so uh, so without the uh, delay so i would like to uh, welcome soumya ma'am and she will discuss you the core concepts related to genetics and aquaculture and we would like love to hear you at the end means after both the speakers finish their talk so you can discuss your doubts with them so at the end so uh, it's a good it's a good chance so we have got uh, two efficient uh, speakers with us and uh, be attentive uh, so ma'am it's over to you ma'am sir thank you thank you so much for this introduction and you're doing a great job so all the best for your future also so shall i start now yeah ma'am you you, you can start Yes, ma'am. It is visible. Okay. So, uh, we'll be discussing a slight uh, overview of genetics, what it is, and a few important questions that are related to genetics. So, since uh, it is very difficult to cover everything up in this limited time period, so whatever the, is important for JRS or uh, whatever we can, we will touch it out in this particular time. So, we'll start with uh, some of the basic terminologies. So. Basically, what genetics is, is that it is a science that deals with the study of heredity and variation. So, what this heredity stands for is the transmission of genes actually from one generation to another generation is known as heredity. So, whatever is transferred, whatever is present, like the transmission of genes, everything is present in like these stories of the chromosomes, which are actually darkly stained bodies present inside the nucleus of the cell. So there are certain sections or certain units inside these chromosomes which are called as genes, which are made up of the DNA. That is uh, basically the nitrogenous bases, the A, B, C, or adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. So this DNA is the molecule that contains the actual biological instructions which can make a species unique in its own way. So as said, DNA is made up of uh, purines and pyrimidines. That is adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. So always remember that uh, purine is double membered uh, ring or one of the ring is six six carbon atom and one is five carbon atom. Pyrimidine is just just one single chain uh, ring. 
and uh, the purines are adenine and guanine. These are the actual chemical formulas for purines and pyrimidines, which are not very important at your stage, but still just have an overview if, if certain times it can be rushed. So if it is asked, so you just have to have an overview of what adenine stands for in that 6 amino purine, then guanine is 2 amino 6 also purine. But still, at your point, it should be always remembered that adenine and guanine are the purines, while cytosine, amine, and uracil are the pyrimidines. So one another important thing that should be remembered at this stage is that uracil is present inside the RNA by its 5 methylated bond that is thymine is present in DNA. So one of the distinguishing features between DNA and RNA is the presence of uracil in RNA while presence of thymine in DNA. So also a very 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 important section is the double helical DNA structure which was made by Watson and Crick in 1953. So they postulated that the DNA is present in, uh, inside the living organisms in the places which are joined together with the help of hydrogen bonds. The hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine are two in number, while for guanine and cytosine are three in number. So the question can be directly asked whether uh, how many number of hydrogen bonds or or an indirect question can be asked uh, which of the bonds is, is more stronger as compared to the other one. So your answer should be you see that is uranium and cytosine bond because it is having three hydrogen bonds of course so it is far more stable as compared to the AT bonds and will take much more time and much more actions for integrating those three hydrogen bonds. Then also some important things uh, for the double medical structure is that the distance between each of the hydrogen is basically pairs that are formed. The distance is 0.34 nanometer and inside in this one meter we would have one helix around 10.5 base pairs are covered. So the total distance covered by one helix is 3.4 nanometer or even it can be said as uh, around 24 uh, and stronger. Any such like in the units amid or uh, defined green and strong you can convert it and So uh, these things are something very important for you to remember from the point of the chemical structure. Then moving on to some other basic terminologies, uh, there are broadly two kinds of radiations. As I was saying that heredity is something that defines uh, the information that is being transferred or carried away from one generation to the other. So the variations are also of two types. One is the heredity variation, another is the environmental variation. So anything that defines the heredity constitution such as genotypes that is which is being transferred or inherited is known as heredity variation. While the one which is not inherited, which is due to the environment, which is due to the geographical areas in which you are present or the food conditions, the culture conditions or the temperature or anything like that is known as environmental variation. Then comes the phenotype and the genotype. So whatever we can see or whatever the physical appearance defines about the particular character or a particular trait is considered as a phenotype. But the inside genetic constitution or the inside study or the story inside of that phenotype is considered as a genotype. So uh, there are certain questions that I have seen that uh, what does this term phenotype mean? So the options are the outward and the physical appearance. So this particular term can be asked because there are some certain keywords in the definitions which are kept as the options. So you should remember those uh, keywords as well. Then comes very, very important terms that is locus and allele. So what locus stands for is that wherever inside the chromosome the genes are present, so that particular position is considered as a locus. And the alleles are the different forms of the same genes. They can be similar, they can be different. So whatever uh, different forms of the same genes present at the same particular locus in the homologous chromosomes is considered as allele. There is the homozygous and the heterozygous condition, which is again defined by the basis of alleles. So, if both the homologous pairs are carrying the similar kind of alleles, it is considered as a homozygous alleles, a homozygous gene. That is, it defines the homozygosity. So, thus, if any particular strain or variety is breeding through, it means it is having the similar genetic backgrounds from generation after generation, it is considered as a pure line. So, there are certain questions in which it can be asked that what was the basis for Mendel to study a monohybrid cross. So, what 
these which are present are not same to each other, they are different. So these conditions are known as heterozygous or basically called as heterozygosity. So in certain cases, these heterozygous conditions can also be considered as hybrids. Once these heterozygous individuals perform way better than something that is homozygous dominant or something homozygous recessive, can be considered as a hybrid. So these homozygous or heterozygous conditions define very important factors that is dominant and recessive, which will decide the character of that particular thing. So dominant gene is something that will express itself. Whatever other allele is present, it won't care. It will express itself, be it in the homozygous dominant condition or be it in the heterozygous condition. But the recessive gene is something which will only express itself once the dominant gene is absent. That is in the homozygous recessive condition. So there are certain individuals or certain cases in which carriers occur. This is basically noticed in the case of disease genes or anything that is related to deficiency or diseases. So all these studies carry a trait known as carriers which is basically inside the heterozygous condition because the recessive condition of the homozygous recessive genes are detritus or methyl in nature so they will kill that particular organism. But once present inside the heterozygous conditions of course they have the dominant allele with them. So dominant allele will give its own character thereby suppressing the character of those particular recessive alleles. So these individuals they won't kill that particular organism but if in future this heterozygous condition is bred with another heterozygous so of course there will be such certain cases in which those lethalities or those deficiencies or those diseases will occur. So such conditions are considered as carriers. So if it is asked in the question that what are the carriers or what defines the carriers so it is the heterozygous condition. Now these are some of the terms and their discoveries and what year they are they gave these particular terms or they discovered uh, like genetics by William Bateson in 1905. Another important thing is the origin of the word is also certain times asked whether it is Greek word or Latin word. So always try to remember the origins as well as the meanings of whatever words they are. Like if it is a Greek word then what is the meaning in English. So these are a few of the terms in the discoveries which are actually very important so at least you should remember these. If you are getting more add them, learn them as well, but these are like mandatory, you should remember them as well as the years. So now moving on towards the principle of genetics. So as already said about the genetics and the, the genes that carry in all those uh, unit of inheritance or all the uh, basic definitions, what is transmitted from one organism to another or one generation to another. So these genes are present inside the nucleus of the cell and they are encoded, uh, like these genes are, are made up of DNA which are encoded in the information we carry. So these DNA again, as the same story says that it is uh, packed inside the compact structures called as chromosomes. And also there are certain chromosome numbers which you should remember, not very important at your stage, but just some slight like for individual carbs it is, uh, it is around 48 and for uh, it, like all the Chinese carbs are that. For example, the grass carbs, silver carbs, it is 50. Then for humans it can be even asked. So remember that the diploid number is 2n. So if it is asking haploid, if you are remembering your diploid number, it is divided by 2. If you are remembering the haploid number, multiply it by 2. It will be the same thing, but always understand what your question is asking, whether it is haploid or it is diploid in number. So now the question arises like who actually figures that the genes are present on the chromosomes. So there were two independent researchers, one was Walter Sutton and Theodore Bibini. Why am I saying independent? Because they, they worked independently, they were not working together, but they were working around in the same year, that is of 1902 and 1903. So there are certain cases in which I have seen the questions which are asked in this way that uh, this particular scientist belongs to which country or has worked upon what species or what area. So you should uh, remember such things as well that Sutton was an American, he studied chromosomes and meiosis and grasshoppers, Bouveri was a German scientist, he studied the same thing that is the chromosomes and meiosis and the CFX. Now comes the very important uh, function or very important question of genetics that is who is the father of genetics which is Bernard John Mendel. So he used 34 different 
I hope these of the genius python survival and uh, how did he come along with such studies was he used the pure breeding process as well as the cross breeding among those 34 different kinds. His work also again is Thank you. 
all the phenotypes or all the heterozygotes will be one is to one is to one. But once these heterozygous conditions or the heterozygous offspring are crossed between each other, they produce the ratios of three is to one. That is, three among them will act as normal because the dominant gene is present, while one among them is the homozygous recessive condition. Or the genotypic uh, ratio will say one is to one is to one. Stating one or one among them is homozygous dominant, one homozygous recessive, and two among them are heterozygous in condition. So there are two other uh, another type of process on this back cross on this test cross. So any of the excellent hybrids that is the heterozygous condition is crossed with any particular parent and genotype, be it homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive. So when such crosses are made, it is known as a back cross. The ratios that are being asked for back cross. Is one is to one, like for the phenotypic ratio or the genotypic ratio. But now it can change, like if there is certain problem or if certain deficiency or certain other things are happening here. So this can change because it can be the condition that this particular heterozygous condition is carrier in nature. So now if you are crossing it with this, uh, like with the homozygous recessive condition, the ratios can change. But the vectors will almost give you the ratios of one is to one. In the similar case, the test cross, the difference between the back cross and test cross is the homozygous condition, that is the first generation individuals are crossed with the homozygous recessive parent. So, wherever the question says crossed with the recessive, the homozygous recessive parent, it means we are talking about the test cross. And test cross always ends up in the ratio of 1 is to 1 is to 1 is to 1. So, if the question says what is the monohybrid test cross, it is 1 is to 1. If it is saying what is the dihybrid test cross, it is 4 times 1, that is 1 is to 1 is to 1 is to 1. So, always remember this can be asked in your question. Basically, the test cross is usually asked, back cross is not usually asked. So, test cross will always end up in the ratio of 1 is to 1. It is only the number of 1s that are being repeated. In the monohybrid, 2 times 1 will be repeated, while in dihybrid, 4 times 1 will be repeated. So, test cross is, is also very important study which is used to identify the gametes with the frequency of the gametes that is whether if it is the heterozygous condition then what are the gametes if it is like the homozygous recessive parent is being identified. So anything present here can be easily identified with the help of test cross. Moving on to dihybrid cross as already said that two different characters will be studied at one particular time. So dihybrid ratio occurs. Now, there is another important thing here for you to understand is there are certain cases in which the question is being asked that if this particular, if this is the design or if these are the characters being studied simultaneously, then what is the number of different gametes that will be formed? So, if the question is in such a way that how many different gametes will be formed if uh, like A, A, B, B and C, C is present. So, if you are crossing this, how many gametes? So, 2 to the power n. So, n means as many number of heterozygous conditions present, that will be equal to n. So anything to the power n will be the number of gametes formed. So uh, the dihybrid cross can be studied by two mechanisms. Again, this can also be a question. So one is the Collet score that everybody knows and it's like universally used. The other one is the Fortin method or the branching method. So um, moving on for the um, the dihybrid ratio, if it is asking the dihybrid ratio, what it is? So, of course, it is asking about the phenotypic ratio. So, the phenotypic ratio will be 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. If it is the dihybrid ratio being asked. If it is asking about the dihybrid genotypic ratio, then the ratio is, uh, the ratio answers will change. That is 1 is to 2 is to 2 is to 4 is to 1 is to 2 is to 1. Or else, if it is, uh, like if you can remember it easier, so it is 1 is to 2 is to 1, then another section is 2 is to 4 is to 2, then another section is 1 is to 2 is to 1. So this is how you can remember a dihybrid cross. Then moving on to the deviations that occur from the Mendel's law, as, or as I was already saying that the law of dominance fails at certain points. So how does it fail? Due to the cases of incomplete dominance. What happens in incomplete dominance is that neither of the alleles that is the homozygous or the recessive alley, it is not dominant, it is not completely dominant in nature. So if they are present uh, together, that is the heterozygous condition, they will mix up together. Or that is their characters will blend up and will give us a third genotype or a third phenotype. So till now what was happening is that in the heterozygous condition, only the dominant alien was expressing itself 
convert giving it from character. But in the case of incomplete dominance, what happens is the dominance and recessive they blend up together and they end up giving you a third phenotype aspect. So, for example, if a red and a white flower is crossed, there can be the homozygous dominant condition can be produced, which will give you the red color. Homozygous recessive condition will give you the white color, but if it is present in the heterozygous condition, it gives you the pink color. So, the, if the question says certain terms intermediate in color, blending of the color, blending of the characters, or mixing of the characters, so if such terms are used, always understand that they are talking about incomplete dominance. If it is not directly mentioned as incomplete dominance, so there are three keywords for you to understand that there is something related to incomplete dominance. So, always the ratio for the incomplete dominance will change from that of the monohybrid cross. And uh, a very, very important question or very important example as well to say for the incomplete dominance is the scale, scale pattern inside the goldfish. So, normally the scale, uh, the goldfish will have the normal scales and uh, it will also have some of the transparent scales. But once these normal scale goldfish are brought with the transparent scale goldfish, they end up giving the calico scales, that is in the heterozygous condition. So if these heterozygous conditions are crossed with each other, one among them will be produced as the transparent scale, two of them will be calico scales and one will be normal scale fish. Thus the ratio for incomplete dominance in the phenotypic or in the genotypic case will become 1 is to 2 is to 1. So always remember, whenever it is asking about the incomplete dominance, your ratios will change. The genotypic ratio will still remain the same, it won't affect anything in the related to the genotype, but your phenotypic or anything that is visible to you or the physical appearance changes. From 3 is to 1, it changes to 1 is to 2 is to 1. Now moving on to another example of uh, the deviations from the Mendel's law, that is the law of dominance, it is the co-dominance. It is somewhat on the similar lines of the incomplete dominance, but what happens here is they don't the allele, the dominant and the recessive allele, they don't blend up together or they don't mix up together. Rather, both of them will be equally responsible for the performance. Like both of them will uh, represent their own characteristics at the same particular time in the heterozygous condition. Now, very very important uh, example for co-dominance is sickle cell anemia in humans. This is usually as with all of, almost all of the exams have seen. What is uh, physical cell anemia is the example of uh, the example of co-dominance. Something like that it can be as so physical cell anemia is related to co-dominance. Then in fish, uh, if, if you have to understand the co-dominance in fish, for example, if we cross a red colored fish to the blue colored fish, we end up with the heterozygous condition or the offspring having the blue color as well as the red color patches. So here again the ratio changes. The genotypic ratio will still remain the same as that of the monohybrid cross, but the phenotypic ratio changes to 1 is to 2 is to 1 because in the heterozygous condition, both of the genes are expressing equally. So again, the keyword here is when both the enemies express equally in the heterozygous condition, it is considered as co dominance. Blending or mixing together will be incomplete dominance. The ratios will be same in both the cases, incomplete as well as the co dominance, that is 1 is to 2 is to 1. Now, till, till now we were talking about the bi-allelic conditions, that is uh, B2 allele is dominant and the recessive one. But there are certain examples or certain cases in which multiple alleles are involved, that is more than two alleles are involved. For example, the human blood type that we study, the A blood group, B blood group and O blood group. So, A, B and O are three alleles which basically give you or end up with different six different genotypes but giving up the three different uh, blood groups that we have. So, in such, in such cases of multiple alleles, again our ratios will change, but now at this particular point, it becomes difficult for us to reduce the monohybrid ratio or the dihybrid ratio since by alleles are not present. So, if the question says what is uh, the, like, the blood groups are considered as what type of examples, it is multiple alleles, they always remember they will affect the same character, but they will have different genetic constitutions. Like A blood group can be defined as both of the arrays being A and A, while A blood group can also be defined as one of them will be A or another one will be O. So such kind of conditions when present is known as multiple allele condition. Now multiple alleles are also being observed in the fish. The inheritance of the melanin formation in the medaca fish or the blood groups that are of humans or the four colors of rabbits are the basic examples that are going to be uh, understood in the case of multiple alleles. So, in, in this previous slide, what did we study was we were studying the allelic interaction. 
functions. That is, one single gene was being be it by allelic, mono allelic, or uh, the multiple allelic conditions. But the study was there for just one of the genes. Now, there are certain cases in which the genes interact with each other. That is, one allele will be in one gene will be interacting with the another gene. So, there are certain cases in which gene interactions take its uh, different phenotypic ratios. This happens in the case of epistasis. What happens in epistasis is that any one particular uh, gene will suppress the action or characteristic of another particular gene. So, another important thing here is the epistasis is originated from the Greek word, which means the stoppage. The one particular gene that is masking the effect or it is suppressing the effect of the other gene is known as the epistatic gene or the epistatic allegiance, the allegiance like that particular gene. And the one that is being masked or one that is being suppressed is known as the hypostatic or you hypostatic gene. So in order to understand the epistasis, by hybrid process are used. Then there are six different types of epistasis that is dominant recessive duplicate genes with cumulative effects. Like, um, I'm not asking you to remember all the gene effects or how they are formed or what they are formed, but still if possible just understand the phenotypic ratios of how do they change and what are the examples related to these particular gene interactions. So um, I'll just tell you some three things that how I used to remember these things. So I'll just tell you that if possible you can remember them likewise or else you can change in whatever way you are comfortable with. So dominant epistasis, the ratio from here like 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1 is the actual dominant, the dihybrid cross that we talk about. So the, this particular phenotypic ratio is going to change in the case of epistasis. So how does it change is in the dominant epistasis these first 9 plus 3 occurs. That is the homozygous dominant condition will add up to the one of the heterozygous condition like any one allele will be the same here that will perform the similar characteristics. So where this will be used to one will be a dominant epistasis. In this similar case for the recessive epistasis, these last two will add up and will end up with the result of 9 is to 3 is to 2. Duplicate genes means it is duplicating something. So what is duplicated here? 3 and 3 is duplicated. So 9, 3 plus 3 is 6. So 9 is to 6 is to 1 is the ratio for duplicate genes with cumulative effects. Then duplicate dominant epistasis means wherever dominance is present is duplicated or is added together to give you any one particular phenotype. So what are the places where the dominance is present is 9 is to 3 is to 3. Because 1 is the actual ratio of the homozygous pure recessive condition. So you add up all these 3, 9 plus 3 plus 3, that is 15, and 15 is to 1. In the similar case, duplicate recessive epistasis. So again, there is certain recessive uh, condition present because it is the heterozygous condition. So then you add 3 plus 3 plus 1, that is 7. So 9 is to 7 will be your duplicate recessive epistasis. So in the similar case, the dominant epistasis can also be added up like the rate 15 is to 3. Then another example section is important. What I like I used to remember is dominance, wherever dominance we are talking about, it is related something to the scale patterns. Scale patterns of goldfish, scale patterns of common carp, or if we see a duplicate dominant epistasis, it will be transparent scale in the goldfish. This DP1 and DP2, what I have mentioned here, are the actual two genes which are responsible for this particular trait. Then in the recessive condition, if we talk about, we are discussing something related to the color. For recessive epistasis, they are discussing about the eye color of the Mexican gate chassis. While for the duplicate recessive epistasis, they are talking about the flesh color of the genome salvage. So, just remember these color patterns or these scale patterns. Scale is related to dominance, color is related to recessive. This, this is not universally said, this is how I used to return. No? So, it is possible or you can use your own ways to remember. Then uh, the duplicate genes with cumulative effects and uh, the dominant and recessive epistasis becomes very easy for me to remember all this. That, okay, fine. When color and scales are restricted to dominance, so duplicate genes is something that is trunk striking its markers by the tiger graph and dominant and recessive epistasis is color color. So now moving on towards the linkage, which is the one of the deviation from law of independent assortment of the mental. So what linkage states is that it is the failure of the two genes to assort independently. That is these two genes present on the similar chromosome are linked together. So such conditions in which two genes present on the same chromosomes are linked together is known as syntenic or syntenic genes. So genes are considered as syntenic in nature. So there can be certain questions in which this term is known that is syntheny or syntenic. So it means they are talking about linkage. So if, syn if syntheny is present or if syntenic genes are present, it means these two genes are linked together. So linkage, it is basically based upon the frequency of the crossing over between two genes. How come we talk about crossing over is that if there is certain distance present between two genes, if these two genes are far apart, it can, they can 
enough space to move from one particular room to another particular room. But if they are present very close to each other, it becomes very difficult. Or if this movement is restricted because of the particular distance present in them, so such things or such aliens or things are considered as synthetic or linking conditions. So where does this crossing over occur? Is another important factor is the prophase one or meiosis. So, um, not important for you to remember all the five stages of prophase one, but still, where does the synapses occur, or where does the crossing over initiates the synaptic complex forms, is the zygote MR stage. The crossing over proceeds in the actual MR stage, or actually the crossing over completes in the dendritic MR stage. So, these three things you should remember from zygote MR. It starts by the synapses being formed, the crossing over initiates, then it uh, almost like Completely proceeds or the actions are being done in the mechanical stage, and it ends up in the diploma stage. So this particular linkage again was studied with um, by a very important scientist that is Thomas Hunt Corbin. He did use the genetic linkage in the year 1910. What did he use? He used Drosophila for his particular linkage study, and he studied the white eye gene. And the miniature things that is the dihybrid crossover means two different characteristics were studied. One was the color of the eye, one was the different patterns of the wings, the miniature wings or the normal wings present. So how did he cross over it? How did he end up with? He used the female with the miniature wings with the white eye wings. So here, it's possible. Remember, he used the crossover, dihybrid cross, linkage was studied normal 1910, and what did he study was? Two characters: one was eye color, white or red in color, miniature or uh, the normal wings uh, pattern of the crossover. Also, relevant terminology related to linkage is one is one of them is chiasma. Chiasma is the actual particular position where the crossover occurs. Like this particular, see if you can see here, this is the place or this is the position where the crossover is occurring. That is, it is being exchanged. Or the other thing that you can see is being exchanged. The genes are being exchanged from one chromosome to the other. So such positions are known as chiasma. Now the crossing over, since crossing over occurs, it means the genes from one chromosome move to another genes, and uh, the, the chromosomes they mix up together. So this mixing up is considered as crossing over. So the um, and now uh, like. The conditions there are two different conditions. One is crossing over; it means linkage is absent. One is crossing over is absent and linkage is present. So always remember, like if centenary or centenary means linkage is present. If crossing over is not uh, is occurring, it means the changes are occurring or the exchanges are occurring. So these exchanges are considered as the recombination events. It means they are recombining to each other in any different form. So, how do we study, or how did uh, the Morgan study the linkage was with the help of test cross? So, he did use the genotype and the phenotype. I have already mentioned with the help of test cross because there, as I was saying earlier, that there are certain cases in which the alleles or genes will not perform in the way that we desire for that is heterozygous and cross with the homozygous recessive will not perform in the similar way. So, there are certain cases which in which they do not perform or they fail to perform. The cases of the linkages are present there. Now, based upon this linkage study, the genetic maps were designed. These genetic maps were designed with the by a very important student of Thomas and Morgan. A very important and interesting fact here is Stephen who was a PhD student from Thomas and Morgan. So that is Morgan was his guide. Stephen studied this particular linkage by uh, his uh, his guide, that is Morgan. And he ended up finding the genetic map in the year 1930. So important things here is if it is said that one percent crossing over it, that is, if crossing over is occurring, it means linkage is not present. If crossing over is occurring, so one percent crossing over tells you that the genetic distance between these particular genes is one map unit. So the unit, the map units of the genetic map units are actually centimeter. So it defines one percent crossing over means one map unit or one centimeter. So in humans, if we see the one map unit means one billion basis points, the distance between one of the one and the other gene is that of the one billion basis points. Now three things.
differential, the gain frequency and the dynamic frequency remains constant the generation after generation. The frequencies can be studied like p plus q square equals to p square plus 2 pq plus q square. Or else it can be said as p plus q square is equals to uh, 1. So the question can be in two different forms. One is the one question can be what is panmixia. Panmixia or panmixic population is the random mating population. Then another question can be what states that the Hardy-Weinberg law is present or what are the deviations from the Hardy-Weinberg law. So if mutation, anything is present, like mutation is present, migration, oscillation is present, if it is acting, it means Hardy-Weinberg law is not being present there. Or else if it is a small population or else if it is non-random mating population. So these four or five are the key terms for you to always remember if the questions are regarding the hardy weinberg law. So if these things are uh, the large population, random mating population, and mutation migration selection are absent. So these five conditions are fulfilled, hardy weinberg law will So there are two different forces that affect these gene and genotypic frequencies from one generation to another. These are systematic and the dispersive forces. The systematic forces are something that can define the gain of gain frequency in the case of its amount, like how much it is being changed from one generation to another and in what direction it means. It is giving a positive change or a negative change or what kind of change it is giving, it can be studied with the help of systematic processes. So these two responsible are migration, mutation and selection. For the dispersive processes, it is predictable only in the amount. It means we can understand that how much of the gene or genotypic frequency is being changed from one generation to another. But in what direction, whether it is beneficial for that particular population, whether it is not beneficial or whether it is in a negative direction cannot be understood. So dispersive processes are studied inside these small populations and the one major force responsible for dispersive process is genetic process. So questions can be regarding these particular terms. That, uh, what is the systematic process, what is the dispersive process. Now, two important things again is one is bottleneck, another is founder effect. So, if a population is reduced in size, like severely reduced in size, so this particular population cannot be considered as the representative of the specific. For example, if we take some of these samples and try to study that particular population, so if we cannot deduce that this particular thing or this particular sample that we have collected is the complete representative of that particular population because it is already reduced in size. So this is known as bottleneck which is the effect of random genetic risk. The other is the founder effect. In founder effect what happens is small number of individuals from the large population they move or they migrate from one particular place to another and they start and produce their own population or community. So initially in this particular small population, they won't have much higher beam frequency as compared to that of the parent population. So now moving on, we will see heritability. Uh, there are few important terms here is phenotype as we already know. Genotype is something that is the genetic makeup. Environment is something that is uh, the environmental conditions that are present for that particular population or individual or species. Then another comes is the additive condition, which is defined inside the genetic conditions or the genotypic makeup. The additive condition is the actual uh, character or actual variation that is being transferred from one generation to another or inherited is known as additive. The dominance and the emphasis we have already studied. So if the question says the broad sense heritability, it is genotypic variation divided by the phenotypic variation. If the question says the narrow sense heritability, it is the additive variance that is the actual variance that is being transmitted or inherited from one generation to another. So, the like, editor variance divided by phenotypic variance. The ratio, uh, the range between the heritability is 0 to 1. So, if the, if the question says, what do you mean by heritability standing for 0? It means there is the complete heritability, like whatever is being defined, is environmental in nature. If it is 1, it means it is genetic in nature. It is not important or it is not as per universally said that if it is 0, it means there is no genetic makeup inside. Uh, like usually or in broadly say in a broad sense, the heritability can never be zero. It can be in some points, but it can never be zero. But still at your particular stage, if the question says, what do you mean by heritability of zero? So your answer should be the environmental conditions are prevailing and they are giving some particular expression. So 
next term is for the inbreeding, which defines the mating among the relatives. So what happens here in this case is the heterozygous condition or the heterozygous numbers decreases and the number of homozygous increases. So this homozygosity can increase in the case of homozygous dominant condition or as well as the homozygous recessive condition. So this particular term is known as inbreeding. It will affect the genotype frequency, but basically it will not affect the alien frequencies, but because the heterozygous is in, as as the rate of heterozygosity is decreasing, in this similar condition the homozygosity is increasing. Then moving on towards the selection. So what selection says is there, is, there are two the kinds of selections. One is natural selection, one is artificial selection. Artificial selection is the actual selection that we as humans we perform upon the uh, these farm animals. So this selection says whenever we select some particular individual, based upon whatever desires that we have, higher growth rate, or whatever characteristics that we want from that particular population. So if we select some individuals, we cross them or we mate them, and end up getting some uh, selected offspring. This is known as artificial selection. So there are two important things here to understand: is breeding and reproduction. There are two terms. One is breeding, one is reproduction. So reproduction means the simple mating or the simple uh, cross between the two like the male and the female or cross between the two organisms is considered as reproduction. But when we are applying our genetic studies or our genetic selection or the variation in order to select the animals or uh, whatever characteristics we want, so if such conditions occur, it will be known as breeding. So two important examples and I'm, I am sure that you would have studied these things like gift tilapia and gentian movie. So gift tilapia is genetically included in the farm tilapia always in the full form of gift. When I was giving it at this particular like many many years ago, it was our what is the full form of gift and that was the time actually when gift was coming into so I hope now it, can, it should not be asked what is the full form of gift, but certain other cases or other other things can be asked. So the world first successful selective breeding program that happened was that is of gift in Afya. The the center that you uh, the study was done in the World Fish Center, it is also known as Ikla, and the strain was used from the Nile Tilapia, that is what is known as Melodicus. The gift tilapia can also be considered as super tilapia. Tilapia, there is another uh, term that is um, one is uh, super tilapia, one is extreme tilapia, something like that, or uh, gift super likewise. So, if certain terms are being asked, which is connect, which is somewhere connected to gift or somewhere connected to tilapia, it means they are talking about the gift tilapia. So, this particular selective Selective Improvement Program started in the year of April 1988. The two important things here is what type of cross allele cross. At your stage, it is not very important to understand what dye allele is or how do they cross with the elbow dye allele. It means dye allele cross. They use eight different varieties, four from Asia, four from Africa. They cross with an each other, they cross all those eight from each other and they ended up with 64 different um, crosses. So this particular cross that is 8 into 8 diary cross was used. Then another important thing it is not mentioned here is that if tilapia came inside India or when did they finally India accepted if tilapia was in the year of 2011. Uh, the date was 20th August 2011. The, the organization in which if tilapia came was RGCA, that is Rajiv Gandhi Center for Aquaculture, which is uh, inside, uh, which comes inside Empeda. So these things are important for you to remember from this tilapia. The other one is Jainti Roo, which was done inside India by ICR Super Institute. This work started in 1992. Why did this term Jainti come? Uh, because in the year 1997, when once the dissemination program or the distribution basically of the Jainti Roo was starting, so that was the 50th anniversary for India. So thus the name behind this particular swan Jainti they name this particular rogu as Jensi rogu. Sipa has also developed a feed which is used for the reproductive breeders. It is known as Sipa brood. It gives better performance for the breeders that are being used. And what type of cross was used here is 3 it would be dye cross. So now the question can be in any way that Jensi rogu is a result of what type of cross or what type of selection. So if what type of selection is being asked, it is selective breeding. What type of cross was being used? Three into three dye cross. Or uh, by by the term JNC comes into pictures, or by 1997 or 50th anniversary. Now, one more important thing that has been alive the past few years is Equa Advantage Salmon. Always remember, Equa Advantage Salmon is not the result of JNC.
genetically engineered variety. So transgenesis will come into answer or genetic engineering will come into the answer. Selective breeding will not or should not be your answer in the case of aquadrantate salmon. So aquadrantate salmon is the name of the Atlantic salmon which is produced with the help of genetic engineering by the company which is known as Aqua Bounty Technologies. So they started this particular work in 1989. And finally, they got the approval from the FDA in, in 2015. So you should you should not get confused with the, because at a certain time it is being asked in your option with this Equa Bounty sandwich. Equa Bounty is the actual company which produces the Equa Advantage sandwich. So remember these things and uh, what type of genetic instance they are genetically in area. So it means there was some particular gene that was being um, added or introduced inside the fish. So what was that? It was the growth hormone regulating gene from the Pacific Chinook salmon. And what was the vehicle that was used or basically we call it as a construct or a promoter that was used was from the ocean pout fish. So remember these two terms also, growth hormone regulated gene from the Pacific Chinook salmon and the promoter sequence that was used or the construct or the vehicle that we usually call in our name as language was from the ocean pout fish. So it is having a huge genetic growth or huge growth as compared to that of the normal Atlantic salmon, but has been approved by FDA in the year 2015. So uh, that's it from my side. Uh, there are many other things in genetics and biotech, but uh, these are some things which are very important, but still a little bit confusing at your term. I'm sure that you are most aware about the DNA or the uh, things related to all those basic stories for the DNA. So you can do that well. Thank you very much, ma'am, uh, for such an outstanding, informative, and effective presentation. Means uh, you have starting from the basics, uh, you have given all the terms, terminologies, the concepts, all the core concepts, and uh, with your experience, you have explained all the relevant concepts, and uh, you have stressed you even stressed what need to be remembered, and you have told some tricks to remember uh, the, the ratios thing. So, uh, it's, uh, overall, it's a very effective uh, uh, presentation. So, uh, thanks once again, ma'am, for uh, for your efforts, for for uh, for your time, and uh, yeah, uh, we are we highly appreciate your presence, ma'am. And uh, th thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And uh, without uh, much delay, uh, I would like to welcome uh, our next speaker, uh, Miss uh, Jane Jacob, uh, ma'am. Uh, she is my very own senior. And she did her uh, uh, UG, uh, BFSC from TNJFU, Duty Corin. She did her Master's in Aquaculture in CIFU and uh, currently she is pursuing her PhD in CIFU. She is my immediate senior and uh, she is an excellent orator, uh, effective speaker. Mm, she is very confident uh, in what she speak. Uh, she is a sincere researcher and a confident speaker as I have said. So without wasting much time, we uh, starting from the beginning, we never... Uh, uh, tell the, their academic achievements, we will just uh, uh, speak about their characters. So that's it. Uh, without much delay, we would like to welcome Ms. Jane Jacob, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, it's over to you, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, Sanakya. I'm audible, right? Yeah, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, ma'am. You are audible. Uh, uh, so thank you for the nice introduction to so kind of you. Uh, so let's directly go into the presentation because our uh, time is running out. Yes, ma'am, yes. So, good evening, everybody. And uh, so, today we will be covering aquaculture. As you know, aquaculture is a very, it is one of the very core subjects of fisheries. And uh, it is uh, actually impossible to concise aquaculture within one hour of 40 minutes. I have done my best. And uh, so, my uh, slides may uh, be a bit crowded. You don't have to get uh, overwhelmed or afraid of that. Uh, it's just the simple things, the things that we are bound to forget. So. Uh, you can use this for revision or something in the last minute. So that's what we are doing and it will help you, I'm sure. Uh, so when it comes to aquaculture, so when, if you cover all these steps, you can uh, complete aquaculture. So 
Uh, you need to cover the history, uh, you need to know your scientific names, you need to know the biology of the fishes. So especially, biology means like uh, what is the feeding habit of the fish and uh, in which uh, column uh, column feeder or bottom feeder what it occupies. Then the culture systems that is the uh, intensive, semi-intensive, RIS, bioflock, all those things. Then breeding. Uh, then uh, thanks to Saumyadi we have completed genetics today and uh, hopefully Chanakya will help us uh, help all of us and arrange for a uh, help class and um, data is data I'll be covering and the uh, nutrition is only little bit so you can cover that and then that will be done with aquaculture. So uh, first I will be talking about the uh, data so world fisheries and aquaculture. Uh, so we know that the total world fisheries production is uh, 179 million metric tons and uh, when they come to aquaculture you have to be careful that if they ask for total aquaculture production that is 114. But if they ask only for aquaculture production, that is 82 million tons. So total means it includes the seaweed production also. So that is a confusing part. So you please be careful and see if it is if they are asking for total or just aquaculture production. And then uh, there is another important thing uh, that is uh, uh, this one. That is the fisheries uh, contribution to the world. So when it comes to total protein, total protein means the entire protein that we are eating, all the dal and uh, chana and everything that we eat is total protein. So in that how much percentage is fish? It is 7 percent, means it is very less. But when it comes to animal protein means chicken is there, mutton is there and uh, whatever is there, fish is there. So in that fish will be higher, 17 percentage. So if they ask for total protein, it is 7 percentage and animal protein if they ask, it is 17 percentage is contributed by fisheries. And uh, then next one is uh, average per capita intake of animal protein. That means uh, on an average in the whole world, if we take one person in one year, how much to his diet fisheries is contributing? So that is 20%. And um, then here we have some uh, important countries. Uh, now we saw the total aquaculture data and how much it is contributing to our foods. Now we will see from where we are getting this uh, major production. So in inland side, China is first, India is second. In mariculture side, uh, marine side, China is first, Norway is second, but India is 13 because normally we are developing with mariculture and cage aquaculture and all. China is first because uh, it is already good in all these things. Norway is second because Norway is involved in the cage culture of salmonids. Then uh, when we come to freshwater, the species is dominated by fin fish, that is majorly carps. Then comes tilapia. But if we go to mariculture, you have to be careful because this was a question in last year's uh, net, I think. So mariculture species, mariculture is dominated by what? We will think, okay, fin fish only, what else is there? Or maybe crustaceans, we will think because Vanami is big exporter and all. But it is not like that. Mariculture is dominated by mollusk. Mollusk means the oysters, bivalves and mussels and all those things, okay? So because mariculture, uh, because mollusks are what extractive species, so you don't have to spend much on feed and all. That's why mollusk will be the maximum production in the mariculture side. So that is a very important thing and you should not put crustacean or fin fish in total world mariculture production. Top species is mollusk. And then uh, from aquaculture, how much people are getting their job? So when we, three, uh, when we see from aquaculture, 20 million people are engaged. Aquaculture is able to give a livelihood to 20 million people. And then comes to the growth. Uh, growth of aquaculture has, um, it has um, multiplied 527 percentage and per year it is 5.3 percentage. These are just data I am trying to fit it inside your head so that when you hear it in my voice, maybe it might get registered. Uh, but this year it has reduced, it has become 3.2 percentage. And um, that is because China has fallen in its production and so it has obviously because China is a lump sum contributor to the aquaculture production in the world and so when China fell the whole world growth also fell. So now this last year's uh, growth in aquaculture if we see that was only 3.2 percentage. So that is about the world and when it comes to India, uh, we couldn't get uh, aquaculture production data exclusively so I will just uh, um, touch upon the total production in India is uh, 13 million metric uh, metric uh, metric tons and uh, inland it is 10 and marine it is 3, inland production highest is from AP and the marine production highest is from Gujarat. And uh, fisheries contribution uh, to India, when we see the total GDA it is only 1.2 percentage and uh, when it is to the agriculture GDA it will be 7.28 percent. So in the world we learned that uh, fisheries contributes to 17% of the animal protein. Similarly, in India, so 
India, we know not all people will eat fish. Even among you, even in my uh, my friends who are fisheries and or who are doing aquaculture, they don't eat fish. So the production, I mean, the percentage contribution of fish to animal protein in India is only 12.28 percent. So I hope I'm clear with this. And next is the top producers. So whatever uh, animal you have or uh, fish species you have, there will be a top producer country and a top species. So that is what is given here. And uh, so this is easily understandable, right? So there are some important things. So rainbow trout. Rainbow trout is what? It is a species from uh, Europe or maybe from North America. But it was introduced in Chile, and now Chile is the top producer of rainbow trout. So imagine that. So that is the thing there. Then uh, India, Vanami is a top producer. Uh, top producer is India. Mm. And overall, marine crustaceans also we see. India has come in the fourth position. That is because thanks to our dear Vanami. So India is coming up, and uh, so hope we can maintain that. And uh, pangashes, we know it is from Vietnam. Uh, then something else, finfish. Finfish is a major producer in the fresh inland side, and that is dominated by grass carp and silver carp because those two are the favorite species in China. So they like silver carp more, but uh, still grass carp is also more preferred. And since it is a herbivorous one, it is uh, better preferred. So it is leading in the finfish production. And uh, seaweed, of course, it is the uh, Laminaria japonicus, uh, that is the uh, kelp, that is only leading in the seaweed production. Mm, Capafagus is growing, especially in the uh, Southeast nation. So seaweed has grown this much because seaweed in the Southeast nations, it is increasing, seaweed production in the Southeast nations. If you look in our country also, Capafagus was introduced in 2005, and uh, we, are, we were basically a grassleria, gelidella type of country, but now we are also going towards Capafagus because for its demand. And uh, also, I, took, I couldn't mention it here. Uh, so you have to remember the uh, means like uh, the what is that the pr product that you get from each of the seaweed. So maybe that might be included in processing also. But I'm just telling. And um, what color algae? You know, like if it is a uh, capafigus, it is a uh, red algae. And if it is a uh, grassleria or gelidella, uh, it is a uh, red seaweed. And all those things. So just brush up those also when you look at this. And then of course you have your scientific names. Uh, this is um, uh, scientific names. You must know our Katla Rohu Mridal, uh, then uh, the Chinese major carps, then you have the big head carp, mud carp, so that is all here. Um, big head carp, um, uh, all these things. Then uh, the Indian species, you know, like which are species are given uh, importance by our uh, CMFRI, SIBA, all those institutes. Uh, so I have mentioned a few. So if I include all, I will have to include all the species on this slide. So I have just uh, cut down to some of the things that I feel is, I felt was important. And anyway, don't forget channels, channels, and let us get that as well. And then these are uh, something that I got this table, so I felt it was nice. And uh, for the biology part, it is not limited to this. You should know about all the species that you learn about. You should know about what is tilapia. So tilapia, they will sometimes they will give it as a phytophagus. Sometimes it will be given as omnivore. So you have to think and use your options. So you should know your biology nicely. So what is that fish and what it will eat? What is its feeding habit? So if you know your biology nicely, you can answer with, uh, with ease, without any confusion or any tension. Uh, so just uh, brush it up and make sure you know nicely. And one thing here is, uh, big head carp is also a very important plankton feeder, okay? Um, then this is the timeline aquaculture. So as uh, when we see any aquaculture question paper, uh, so I am talking about uh, maybe when we come to a, a PhD exam or net exam, and um, I think in your UG wala also there will be at least one question somewhere from aquaculture history. So I am putting here the most famous question about aquaculture history is uh, classic of fish culture was written by who? It was written by Fran Lee. So it was written in 500 BC. And then another question comes. Uh, who, which leader banned the use of common carp? So that story goes like this. It was the Tang dynasty and there was this uh, emperor, his name was Li. And coincidentally, in China, uh, Li is the same thing for common carp. So he banned carp, no carps. Common carp in the sense carp. So he said no carps because it is my name. People will simply, hey, get that carp, get that carp. So get that Li, get that Li. So it's like talking about the king. So he didn't like that. He banned it. So what the people told, people did, they had to do, they need something else, you know, fish was a major part of their diet. So they went and they caught the other species. So that is a silver carp, the big head carp and mud carp and all. And so that was the Tang dynasty, Lee and common carp story, okay. Then classic of fish culture by Fran Lee. 
then coming to india so these two are the important things in terms of the world uh, uh, when you see the questions that has come now so there are other things like uh, uh, what is that uh, eels were maintained in stew ponds in europe and uh, oysters also were used like that similarly and uh, then that sava tambak of uh, the hindu region in uh, hindu 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 rain in indonesia and then the laguna de bay in philippines so all these are important things but uh, these two are very common this uh, classical fish culture by family and tang dynasty leevala then coming to india so the important thing is um, during the war time they used to poison the reservoirs so reservoir is uh, in those times when we see tanks and reservoirs are that is a main water source we don't have pipe water no people will come there and take water and go so when you poison a reservoir you are destroying a whole village you can literally destroy a whole village the people will die there of of thirst and no food so that was done that was described by kautilya in his book artha shastra it was written around 300 bc then manasultara that was by uh, someshwara and in that he is describing about the small sport fishes so we will think that sport fishing was something that uh, the british people came to india and so they were only they only introduced recreational fisheries and all but it was not like that so in 1127 itself in india itself one of our kings had uh, uh, done sport fishes sport fisheries like that so you can remember that then there is one question it is the first scientifically designed fish farm in india so that was created uh, that was built in uh, sumkeshwara in krishna district it is now in andhra pradesh and that was built in 1911 uh, so then our most famous question from aquaculture is uh, cage culture origin of cage culture it was from cambodia and uh, in cambodia or kampuchea whatever comes in your option don't get confused uh, it's the same and uh, so that is the for what cage culture that time it was done for uh, culturing the air breathing fishes air breathing fishes like the clarias and mugor and uh, and even the channa species no they were used uh, then uh, in 1940 then for java in java that is in indonesia they used uh, bamboo no with bamboo they will make small enclosures and that was used to culture the common carp then modern cage culture so the first important thing for modern cage culture was the yellow tail culture in japan that is uh, seriola quinquiriata and uh, then further uh, by 1950 there was the uh, industrial development took place and norway came inside the picture so now if we say the industrial level big cages it's all norway and it's the atlantic salmon then we have our india also uh, we also tried everyone in the world is trying cage culture we also should try cage culture so Uh, we were doing in our swamps and all in the flood plain wetland areas and uh, that is in ganga yamuna flood plain regions uh, so we made small small cages and we also cultured air breathing fishes what we had we had what we have that we had a channa and we had um, some small cat fishes so we cultured them in the cages in india then officially uh, all the world is developing in marine cage culture so india also decided our team of our scientists Uh, in 2007 they uh, introduced the sea cage in Vishakhapatnam so here there is a catch here so sea bass if we see sea bass sea bass is everything about sea bass but sea bass for the first time cage culture in 2007 was done by cm akbare not sea bass uh, so you have to know that point and then there is about cage and then comes to pen pen started in 1920s in japan and then it spread to china and uh, so philippines philippines it is all uh, small small nations they had uh, they are island nations so, so they have more water so they just cover the bay even in japan they just cover the bay and they do culture in japan even now for tuna brood stock rearing and all no, they just cover one bay bay means what uh, like a small inlet kind of area right you know what is bay bay of bengal water is going inside so they just uh, so from the tip of kanyakumari till that end if you cover up that bay and you will use it as a large pond so that is all that is a pen uh, so in japan they are using it for tuna brood stock bearing even now and um, then indonesia that is that uh, sawa tambaks in there they used to do milk fish carps and also there is brackish water but still uh, carps also carp can tolerate salinity up to 10 ppm you know, so it is okay uh, then uh, of course india also had that is in bhavani sagar dam that is in tamil nadu they did for uh, carps and the pillai madam lagoon that is in um, uh, rameshwaram in south tamil nadu they used it for mullet rearing so mullet is a very prized fish so you will get small mullet um, uh, uh, fingerlings or something and you can rear them in the pens until they reach a marketable size then uh, chilika lake 
Jano uh, is the type of uh, bamboo made cages that is used for rearing the mullet, similar to what was happening in Rameshwaram. And then later on, when we got our uh, plastic nets, so uh, we made one nets, then we made we call it gerries. So net enclosures we made, and those were used for prawn culture. Uh, next is um, some of the, some important persons, no? Like uh, pioneers in aquaculture, you can say. Uh, I couldn't get uh, more. Of course, there are more people, but I couldn't uh, find time to include all of them. So these are just some important persons. H. B. Wilson, I told about the scientifically designed fish farm. Then F. J. Mitchell, he introduced trout eggs uh, to Harvard in 1906, I think. Uh, this is H. R. Lynn and Peter. So this was there when I wrote my. JRF uh, exam like you people that was in 2017. That time they asked. You know what they asked? They asked about the initial of these two people. So Lin P method is there and that Lin and Peter is there. And uh, what is the initial of for one of these people? They asked like that. So you people be careful and learn the initial also. Then comes the eye stock ablation. Eye stock ablation in might is used in crustaceans. So that was uh, a made device by the scientist Panos. And then these are some confusing names, no? Like uh, we have prawn and shrimp, and we have these all these names, link, Fujimura, Komata, Fujinuka, all these names we have. So you be clear. Uh, so link is for uh, uh, link, Fujimura, and Nakamata. These people are for prawn, okay? Giant prawn, freshwater prawn, macro brachia. And when we come to the uh, Fujinaga, Fujinaga, these two are the same person. So in the local dialogue, there is a difference. And so when the papers came out, it the name differs. So Fujinaga, Hodinaga is the same person. He did in 1930, 1932, uh, he did the breeding of Pinus japonicus. So he is like the father of shrimp breeding. And uh, there's nothing like that, I'm just telling. And then comes in Taiwan, uh, Pinus monodon was that. So in Japan, they have Pinus japonicus. And in Taiwan, uh, Leo, Dr. Leo, he did in Pinus monodon breeding. Uh, so that is all about our history and data and uh, then there is something CR said. Uh, why we need CR said for aquaculture? Because we have coastal aquaculture. Uh, so we have to know what is the CR said regulations. So we have, uh, that was there in 1991, that was um, the next step to the Environment Protection Act of 1986. And uh, so CR said 1, 2, 3, 4, they made it and uh, before 4 used to be for our islands but now it is, uh, uh, before they used to this one. But now it is for uh, island protection is separate. So that was all evaluated finally by uh, Shailesh Nair committee in 2018. And um, so one, you have to remember sensitive areas like mangroves or coral reefs or something like that, no, which is very precious to us. If they ask, it all comes under area one. And then area two are the developed areas. Uh, three is the, area four is the water. So in water only you can do fishing and also artisanal fishing and all those will happen in area four. Uh, that is CRZ four. And uh, there is one thing, uh, so usually in this uh, CRZ 1 and 2 and all, uh, there will be no aquaculture. But now they have allowed uh, hatchery alone you can establish. There is no coastal aquaculture allowed, but you can establish hatchery uh, within 200 meter of the uh, high tide line. That is because uh, for a shrimp hatchery, what is the most important thing you need? Good quality water. And if you need good quality water, you need to make a well in the sea or uh, ocean and bring it in. So if the, uh, there is regulation telling that you should not, Naichalega, you should not keep any hatcheries here, it is under here said, then your uh, hatchery owner will have to make a, uh, that much long pipe inside to where his uh, hatchery is there. So that is making a large number of costs and otherwise what the hatchery owner will do, I don't want from that, he will take from nearby itself. So nearby means what? It will not be having the required salinity or it might be having polluted water. So the, hatch, uh, the quality of our seeds will not be good. So the government and all these people had big discussions and they decided that uh, Coastal Aquaculture Authority have released a draft telling that uh, up to 200 meters we will allow the uh, hatcheries to be established. So that is an exception to the Coastal Regulation Zone Act. And uh, now we have this critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable, so what is the meaning? And uh, so I've just given a definition. The, these definition will vary, you know. In some places it will be like, um, in uh, critically endangered means more than 90% of the breeding population is gone. They're not there. And um, so here I've just taken the simplest one, like extremely high risk means it is critically endangered. Very high risk means it is endangered and 
simply high risk means it is vulnerable so just look for these key points if you are lucky if it is there we can click that and otherwise you look for that this will be 90% of and some 10000 numbers something like that uh, i couldn't find that when i was looking for this value so i just put this and then so we covered about um, the general c accepting the data the uh, the species uh, the scientific uh, culture systems now coming to water quality so now we are in aquaculture and the first thing you know is um, water quality is important in aquaculture uh, so do uh, that is dissolve oxygen uh, so dissolve oxygen uh, will decrease if temperature and salinity increase so uh, that is there then it is least in early morning because uh, through in the night plants won't produce uh, won't do photosynthesis so there is no release of o2 so what happens early morning the do will be very less so if you are working in shrimp farms and all they will uh, the people will be very vigilant that in the morning there should not be any power cut and uh, if early morning na, like between 3 to 6 and all um, if your uh, power goes down and if your uh, generator is not working your whole um, shrimp your whole uh, what is that uh, your whole catch or the produce in the pond will be gone by the morning so they will be very alert in the early morning times to make sure that the aerator is working fine so that is the importance of do in the early morning do will be very least and it will be peak in the afternoon so, uh, as the pl- this one plankton sun will get up and the sunlight comes in they will start their primary production and oxygen will be there it will be maximum by the afternoon <coughs> so then ammonia ammonia is the most dangerous thing that we have in aquaculture if there is no aquifer there is no ammonia there is no problem for us only we can consider anything everywhere uh, so but it's not there ammonia is there so ammonia what happens is one ph increase ammonia will increase 10 times so remember that so if they ask you a question like uh, uh, in temperature of uh, 24 degrees celsius ammonia was uh, at uh, ph of uh, uh, 7.8 ammonia was so much and uh, what will be the ammonia when it is at uh, 6 ph okay so if they should give you all the one will be, all will be all values will be higher than the particular value and one value will be less so take the lesser value ph is decreasing ph would have, ph is decreasing ammonia would have decreased so you can put that then uh, increase in temperature also will increase the ammonia and ammonia can be reduced how you can put zeolite you can uh, increase the aeration and um, even increasing the carbon dioxide content will increase will decrease the amount of ammonia in the water and uh, the ammonia most dangerous is unionized ammonia that is nh3 okay not nh4 plus that is ionized uh, free ammonia that is nh3 unionized ammonia is the most dangerous ammonia because uh, it can diffuse into the fish uh, body and blood and all and it will uh, reduce the blood carrying capacity of the hemoglobin then comes ph uh, so ph is um, it is dependent on the uh, carbon dioxide and uh, the carbon dioxide will get inside the water and will form carbonic acid so when we see the low ph no, 4 to 6 that will be because of the carbonic acid acid is there no? acidic so that is the thing as uh, carbonic acid and carbon dioxide will be reason for the acidic ph that is 6 and then when it comes to 6 to 12 increasing ph that will be because of bicarbonate hco3 and uh, greater than 12 will be exclusively carbonate but that is a very rare situation in our aquaculture case so ph will be uh, so ideal ph will be between uh, 7 to 8 for the water and 6 to uh, uh, 6 to 7 for the soil <coughs> and uh, that is that and uh, there is one this was there in the just now what net finish now that also so early morning early morning the ph will be what it will be acidic because uh, it is because there is no uh, carbon uh, there is more carbon dioxide production uh, respiration is happening but there is no oxygen uh, coming in because of photo, there is no photosynthesis to take the carbon dioxide so more number of carbon dioxide will be present in the water and that's why in early morning the water will be acidic so that is do will be least in early morning and ph will be acidic in early morning ph also will be least and by mid afternoon ph will go to alkaline situation because the carbon dioxide will be assimilated by the plankton and the um, plants present in our pond for the photosynthesis uh, then h2s so usually water we say temperature increases okay do decreases temperature increases okay uh, ammonia increases but the temperature increases uh, sorry ph increases and uh, we will say ammonia increase but h2s will decrease so that is a different thing from all these dangerous people so i'm telling so if you increase lining of your pond you can decrease your h2s production so h2s is where it will be in the uh, lower part of your uh, um, what is that pond bottom so if you can line your pond bottom you can substantially 
reduce the amount of hydrogen sulfide that is produced in your body. Then salinity. So it is that temperature will increase, salinity will increase. Why? Because you have a you have a bowl of water, you keep it in sun. Um, so we are from a what is a coastal area, and uh, you keep it in the sun. So what happens when you go look in the evening? Uh, the side of your uh, uh, bowl will have salt particles. So what is happening there? The salt is getting concentrated. So what is happening? So uh, salinity is increasing because temperature is remaining. Salt means what? what the amount of salt present in the water is that for your salinity. So temperature increases and your salinity also. So this is a uh, Okay, this is a very crowded slide, but it is very simple. Uh, so basically, aquaculture systems you can classify based on the salinity. So PPT means parts per thousand. That means how many grams of the salt is present in one liter of water. So fresh water is less than point five. It's thirty to thirty five PPT or around forty also chalega. And uh, metahaline means greater than thirty five. Then super saline is there. That is. Like 300 ppg salt concentration, no? That is like super saline water. And uh, then soil permeability. So when you take before that, we'll see sand particles. So sand particle before this gravel is there. Gravel particle means it is greater than 2 mm. Then sand. Sand is 2 to 0.5 mm. Uh, then silt is even smaller than sand. That is 0.5 to 0.002. And clay is very less. Clay is less than 0.002. So this is important. Uh, so mostly they have asked uh, what is the size of clay particles. So clay particle is less than 0.002 mm. Uh, now we have the parts of our dike. So dike is the part that is the protection, no, like protection boundary for our pond. So dike we have uh, the top of the dike that is called the crest or the crown. And then we have the side slope. Then this is berm. Berm is what it is a platform. So in this platform you can stand and you can. Cast your net for sampling, or you can hold your drag net. Na the side of the drag net can be held while harvesting. And also, what this berm will do, it will help to reduce your uh, soil erosion. Suppose there is heavy rain here, so when there is heavy rain, water comes. Water will obviously fall to flow to the sides. And when water is falling like this, if it comes like this, it will just come directly here. It will wipe out our whole uh, slope of our pond. But if we have this berm. It will give a push. It will give a uh, stop to the water flowing with all.
is coming with Brazil only, so Brazil is okay. And uh, this is Russia. Most of what we study, we forget Russia. Russia also did in 1937. Uh, they have done. Uh, And uh, so these are the important inducing agents. Uh, so human chorionic gonadotropin that is uh, that's produced by the chorionic uh, villi villi of the uh, this one. And uh, so that is a crude HCG is called sumac and purified is called antioxidant. Then we have cyanohorin. Cyanohorin means it is a mixture of uh, human chorionic gonadotropin and mammalian hypophyseal extract. So normally what we do is uh, we take the fish pituitary, you know, this is a carp pituitary extract, but Cyanohorin was the, they used to, they tried with everything, no, that is how we, so everything is about a trial and error. So, Cyanohorin was tried, that was HC plus mammalian hypophysial extract. Then, puberogen. So, remember, puberogen, so FSH and LH, those two are the main uh, gonadotropic hormones, that is GTH1 and GTH2. And uh, so, when we come to puberogen, it is a mixture of both. So, we, uh, we hope that if we put a mixture of both, we can achieve uh, the initial process of methylogenesis and then of maturation and ovulation. So we tried it's a mixture. So remember 63% FSH, 34% LH. So just register it in your head, okay? Don't get confused whether this one is that one or that one is this one. Don't think like that. Just by heart it, that's all I have to tell you. Uh, then anti estrogens That's because we are using anti estrogens because uh, it is thought that um, estrogens will uh, reduce the uh, the what is that ovulation and all those things no? so anti-estrogens we are giving to increase that um, uh, effect so that is tamoxifen and promethine these are all synthetic anti-estrogens that are created and then we have the most common method so that is as revolutionized acupuncture and breeding that is a gonadotropin releasing hormones and the dopamine and supports so that was given devised by Lynn and Peter HR Lynn and R.E. Peter so remember the initials and these are the most uh, commonly used um, inducing hormones. So here I want you to remember uh, what is important is all are based on salmon. Uh, you know, these are all uh, salmon gonadotropin releasing hormones and um, they are analogs of course. But Ovapel uses mammalian gonadotropin releasing hormones. So Ovapel is a different person. So remember that and remember this also. Uh, the dosage of that particular GnRH and the dopamine antagonist in these two. And uh, then what is the antagonist that is used? So I can tell you something. Here OVA prim is there. So there is an R here. And uh, similarly we have domperidone. So that is how I remember it. And then here OVA tide we have. And so here we have primozide. And uh, then OVA pel. So pel is there. So we are having mammalian. And we also have metaclopromide. So forget this I. This is this claw there. Claw and pel. And then OVA FH is by Vocart. It is only GNRH. I, I, it has a normal dopamine, a dopamine antagonist. So, ovaprim, domperidone, ovatide, pimozide, ovapel, metaclopramide. So, that is a dopamine antagonist present there. And then we have carp breeding. So, carp breeding is like the heart of aquaculture because carp is the most um, leading fish in fin fishes. And um, so, carp breeding is a big thing. Uh, so Indian major calves. Indian major calves, first we, we didn't know about breeding. So we used to collect the seeds from the wild. So that was in the flood time. So first flood used to be our unwanted species. Uh, so what they used to do, unwanted fish species, uh, they will lay their eggs earlier and they will bring out their fry and uh, fingerlings. So you you go and uh, in the next flood what are these carp uh, babies will come so you can take and eat them. That's why in the first flood you have a First flood, what you will get, you will get all the dangerous uh, predatory and weak fishes, no? their uh, fry you will get. So you don't collect in the first flood, oh, okay, it's raining, come, we'll go and collect carp sheep. You don't do that. You wait for this, uh, after the first flood is over, you go, and that time only you will get your um, IMC uh, fry or uh, IMC seed in that way. So that is collected using shooting nets, uh, they are called Benji gel and uh, that is a conical bag net. So these shooting nets, no, you will fix them in the water. Uh, in the side of the water, no shallow region, uh, because the uh, uh, fries are babies, no seeds, uh, they can't just go with the full current, they will go in the side, 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 so you will fix your shooting net in the side, and the water will come, and uh, towards the end, uh, like a uh, trawl, you have the cordon, no, like that, you will tie the, you will tie the uh, mosquito, that is a gamcha in the end of the shooting net, and you can remove that, so that is a tackle, it will take, it will have the seeds, you will, occasionally you will remove that, and you will put your seeds in the, whatever vessel you have, or the pit that you have created, and 
you will store them there. So that was what was happening before 1957, of course. And um, then people, uh, Manuseli, he started about the breeding, bandha breeding. No? So he thought, why don't we uh, imitate rain and try to um, the, try to induce the fishes. So came in bandha breeding. So we have dry bandha and wet bandha. Dry bandha is seasonal. Uh, that means uh, uh, it is uh, only in the rainy season you will get uh, water in the dry bandh. But in uh, wet bandh, it is perennial. All throughout the year, you will have water in a particular the deepest part of the band you will have water and uh, there you can have your uh, fruit stock. Fruit stock can be kept in that uh, area. Uh, so that is about uh, band reading. Then uh, you have the shallow part of the band, uh, the deeper part of the band. The shallow part is called Moan and the deeper part is called Bulan. And then um, uh, the, there was a development in this band itself, uh, the Bangla bands. No? That was uh, bands that was made of uh, cement masonry. With cement itself, you, Im you imitated the natural band and you made one that is called a Bangla band. It is a type of dry band and it is made up of uh, cement masonry. Mm, it is seen in West Bengal. So, scientific band reading it is seen in Madhya Pradesh, but uh, band reading basically started means it is in West Bengal and uh, Bangla band is also seen in West Bengal. Then sympathetic breeding is an important thing when you come to IMC um, breeding in bands. So sympathetic breeding is what means uh, you inject only 10% of your uh, brood stock. And uh, so these people will get to their inducement because of these hormones and they will start to uh, release the, uh, what is that, the gamut. And so the others also. And also there will be pheromone production and all that that will induce the remaining brood stock also to, uh, to breed. So that is called sympathetic breeding. And then IMC, uh, when they when the average um, fecundity of IMC, um, so in some in handbook it is given 1.5 lakh eggs, uh, but in our Ratna Kumar it is given 2 to 2.5 lakh. So you see the options and you answer accordingly. And uh, the highest fecundity is seen in Rohu. So highest fecundity, so obviously the size of the eggs will be small, and so the largest uh, size egg is seen in Katla. And um, then Chinese major crops, we have a uh, grass carp. So you will think, uh, I used to think grass carp, okay, grass carp is grass color, so it's egg also will be in green color. No, it's not like that. Grass carp egg is somewhat brownish in color. Uh, then silver carp has a bluish tinge, and common carp egg is golden yellow, and common carp egg is sticky. So, half a breeding of carps, uh, how you used to do? You used to put your um, brood stock inside your half no? and uh, after they are bred, the brood stock will be removed and the egg can be maintained there itself. Mm, so, in this history of uh, egg maintenance, we had this pitch, then we made the uh, chabba, we put mustard cloths in the pit, then we put some vessels in the pit, then we burst into the jar hatchery, and then we have hopper breeding in the middle, and finally we have Chinese circular hatchery. So, that is the most uh, predominant uh, one of uh, hatcheries in um, anywhere, in China and India or not. So, common carp, and uh, so, what is the thing, this IMC and all, they can't be bred artificially. But common carp is not like that. Common carp is a uh, good uh, uh, fish and it can be manipulated to breed um, uh, artificially. And uh, and it has uh, two two times also in a year you can breed your common carp. So, one in winter and one in summer. Uh, so, for common carp, it is a Dubish method. It is practiced in Europe. Then we have uh, Sundanese method that is in Indonesia. So, in uh, Dubish method, you will plant some um, nice, because common carp has sticky eggs, no? So, in the pond, uh, you will plant your uh, nice growing, long growing grass and you will let your uh, uh, carp grow in that. And then when it is time for the breeding and when it is induced by rain or something, it will lay its eggs and eggs will be stored in the, uh, eggs will stick to the grass. But Dubish method, what is the disadvantage means? Uh, the broad stock is also there, no? They can go and damage the eggs unknowingly. Uh, so that is a disadvantage. Then came the Sundanis method and uh, that is also similar to this but here we are not giving grass. Uh, in Indonesia they have kakabans. Uh, kakabans means it is made up of inju plant. No? You take the plant and you separate them and you make them like a mat and uh, you put them for the substrate to attach, to attach the uh, other sea legs of common cup. Uh, so this 5 to 8 kg, uh, 5 to 8 number of kakabans per kg body weight of females. So there also what happens is the, uh, the uh, brood stock is inside, no? so that is a little bit of disturbance. Then came the uh, Jimindi method, that is also in Indonesia. Here what we do, we will have a separate, uh, a band will be there. So 
uh, one side of the bun we will keep water and both sides water will be there. It's a big pond, you divide it with a bun. And one side you will release your good stuff for baby. And once the eggs are laid, uh, you will break this bun and you will only push the root stuff to the other side of the pond. And this side our uh, eggs, uh, eggs that are stuck to the kakabans and all will be safe. So that is the Jimindi method, which is practiced in Indonesia. Then Indian method, we have hydrilla. So we used to put, we don't have kakaban. So we put hydrilla or some, um, what is it, with uh, coconut leaves we can make some mats. Then what we had, uh, this gunny bags are there, no? plastic wala or uh, the jute wala. With that we used to make substrate and we used to give our uh, fishes. In China they used to use ceratophyllum and icon. So hydrilla was used in India, um, are a uh, injuk plant that is um, uh, for kakabans that was used in Indonesia and the ceratophyllum and iconia was used in China. Then uh, of course, uh, then when we came to Chinese circular hatchery, we can't put the sticky eggs inside, no? Uh, they will all clump up together and they will be damaged and uh, the fertilization and the uh, ha ha what is it? hatching and all is very much reduced. So we decided to devise some techniques to remove the stickiness. So that was salt carbamide, that means NaCl and urea we used to mix in a particular uh, ratio. And uh, we used to nicely, uh, what is that, nicely uh, mix with our uh, common carp eggs and that will remove the stickiness. And then we wash them two, three, two, two to three times and then they are released into the common uh, Chinese circular hatchery incubation pool. And milk powder is also used. If we are not using milk powder, we, use, we should use pure milk. One is to nine ratio, we can use pure milk. Mm, then Chinese carp, uh, so Chinese carp hatchery was created in the 1960s. Uh, so, and there are some uh, capacity of Chinese uh, hatchery incubation pool is 7 lakhs to 10 lakh eggs. And uh, there, you have to remember for harbor breeding, we use 2 is to 1 ratio. But Chinese carp, uh, because uh, there is large number of fish can be put inside, we can put in 1 is to 1 ratio itself, no problem. So, this is an important thing. So, that is uh, carp, carp uh, is very important to us. So, I dedicated an entire slide to carp. Now, we have breeding and seed production of other fishes. So, you have to know the fecundity of all the fishes, I think, and um, but um, I couldn't put that in these slides. So, just make sure you know, I have an at least a rough idea of the fecundity of all the species. And uh, so, here we have the uh, sex ratio for breeding, so male and female. And uh, so, here when males are uh, one, one male and two or three female means, the male uh, has a high amount of... Um, a sperm in their uh, milk. So that's why we have only one male. But for carp and all, it's not like that. So we are using two females and one male. So just remember that uh, trout and jalebi and all, we will we'll use one male and the number of females. But uh, most of the fishes like carp, cyprinids and uh, most of the fishes, we'll use two males for one female. Uh, so remember that. And uh, for shrimp, this is in the, uh, we are keeping in the maturation tanks. So it is in this section. Uh, then this is a dosage for uh, catfish. So after carps, next to carps, we have um, uh, catfish breeding. So tilapia don't need to breed, so prolific feeder will breed by itself. Uh, what is significant for us is the catfish breeding. So similar to common carp, clarius is also having adhesive eggs. Uh, so we have to take care of that and we will put it in uh, small, small tubs. So it is, but their fecundity is very less. No? Small, it will weigh what maximum 150 gram one fish will weigh. But uh, carp is not like that, will weigh 1 kg, 1.5 kg. So uh, we get less number of eggs for clarius. So we will use uh, tubs, small type of flow through systems for uh, catfish hatchery. Uh, so uh, no need to remove the, this one also because less number of fecundity is there. The eggs won't clump up much. You can separate the eggs also. So you can use it in this one. Mm -hmm. But fungus has a comparatively higher uh, fecundity. So for pangashes, when they are doing breeding in um, uh, breeding or not, they use a circular hatchery itself, or they make a smaller model of uh, than the Chinese circular hatchery for pangashes breeding. Because now pangashes is uh, gaining momentum in uh, production in India, so the farmers have moved on to large scale breeding, and they prefer uh, similar uh, Chinese circular hatcheries for pangashes breeding also. Then, uh, so we have produced the seed, and then nursery rearing of calves is there. Uh, so this is not only for calves, for any pond management you need all this and uh, we have learned also, this is what we have been learning from our first year of BFSC. Uh, so just a refresher, maho oil cake, uh, saponin content 4 to 6 percent, dairy root powder 5 percent and uh, growth has 9 percent roti uh, Then uh, so 250 ppm means we will use uh, about um, 2500 kg per hectare, we will dose the maho oil cake for the pond management. And uh, so what is the first first feed for 
or carp means it is rotifer. Earlier stages we will give rotifers and then only we will go for cladder. So if it is given option, uh, best to feed for fry or spawn of uh, carp. And you have a Daphnia, Moina and um, what is the rotifer, Brachionus and you have Arthenia. So answer will be Brachionus. So rotifers are the first to feed. And then later on you can feed with Cladocerons and other zooplankton means Arthenia. And then uh, the dosage for the aquatic meat management. So mostly the marginal weeds, no? like Typha and all which is there in the side, we can cut them off. And uh, floating weeds we can use to body. Uh, then for uh, Simazine is used for submerged and filamentous algae because Simazine is soluble in water but 2,4-D is not. So there is no point in using 2,4-D for what is under the water. Okay, So 2,4-D is not preferred for that. Malus. Then we have the insects. So most notorious one is this black swimmer and it's of Subovieri. And also Cyclops is also a danger for uh, calf spawn and uh, back swimmer and so remember the ranatra water stick insect and hydrometra uh, measurer uh, so all those things you remember then the important the oil soap emulsion so what is emulsion will do because all these insects know they will float on the water surface so you will put oil and soap you will it will also form a film on the water and uh, their uh, appendages and all will be stuck and they can't move so that is in the ratio 3 is to 1. So oil is higher, 56 oil and 18 is soap. And then uh, there is also it is replaced by kerosene and uh, tea pol also you can use. So all this you know, I am just uh, giving, no, just, you have to be clear on all this. So I am just putting it. Then marine filtering breeding, it is a growing field uh, and uh, it is a very much, it is, it is given much trust because we have a big coastline and if we can use that resources it will be good. That will also reduce the pressure on the fishing pressure on the marine fish resources. You know, it should be conserved for the future. So if we can promote cage aquaculture and all it will be good. Even pond aquaculture of marine species will be very good. Uh, so there is capital. So because marine species are not, we have not uh, reached that level like in carp we can do in monsoon we can breed easily. No, we are not like that. So what we do is we use a catheter uh, to see the condition of the ova. If the ova is uh, grown, uh, it is um, uh, reached to a particular size, then we can use the fish. We can induce the fish for breeding. Otherwise, there is no use of giving hormones. The fish will not uh, release its eggs. So there, even if you strip the eggs, won't be uh, the fertilization capacity will be very less. So, and then uh, we have passive integrated transponder tag that is commonly used for the uh, tagging the fishes, especially the group stock and all. Uh, so the species that are being uh, bred or which have been standardized is Bicema, Farais, Copia, Grouper, Indian Pompano, Silver Pompano, Snappers, Green Mussel is there in uh, Virinam. They have even developed uh, a different uh, technique, no? Uh, um, what is that? Upflow, I'm not getting the name. So that is like uh, downflow and upflow, no? Based on that technique, they are made uh, for maintenance of uh, spag settlement in mussels. Then in sea bar, they have sea bar smellfish and they are working on vanami for bioflop technology and all and the mullet of course. Uh, then RGCA is working, RGCA has standardized seed production of mud crab and uh, sea bass so you can get. Then this is the larval stages of our uh, crustaceans. So other than the marine fishes and uh, uh, the fin carp, fin fish, uh, so we have all these important species. So what all, uh, these are all the important points, you have to remember all the points in this uh, slide I will say. And uh, there are some confusing things that lobster in general it take about 300 days to complete its larval cycle. But the sand lobster or slipper lobster that is penis orientalis, no? that is, it will take only 26 to 32 days. So that is the uh, difference, um, it is an exception to lobster larva and it will take totally 26 to 32 days only in place of the 300 days that is there in uh, spiny lobster. Uh, then uh, you have 11 zoeal stages in prawn. Uh, so naplia is the non-eating. The feeding stage is zoea. So in prawn they directly feed. It means first uh, first zoea, second zoea it will start to feed. So from the first day itself you will start giving some uh, egg custard and all those things and then you will uh, slowly go on uh, artemia naplia. And uh, But shrimp is not like that. First it has naplia stage then only protozoea is coming. So zoya only will eat. Uh, so zoya only mouth will be open. So what happens? Uh, so okay, um, let six naplia finish. After zoya starts, we will feed. But you should not wait for that. By the time if you wait, uh, zoya will uh, means naplia will molt and become zoya without your permission itself. 
So if you won't know that all your zoya will be eaten by some nice uh, stronger zoya. So what you do by naplay five or six itself, you will start putting the artemia naplay to the shrimp larval rearing tanks. Okay. Uh, then uh, uh, not artemia naplay. Earlier stage you have to do ketosara, sorry. And uh, later on, um, after it becomes to the stage of uh, mysis and all, you can give artemia naplay. So ketosara is given because ketosara has spines and this. Uh, uh, this one can go and grab it nicely, so we will give ketoceros. And then, there is this thing, in uh, shrimp breeding, we have two systems, Galveston system and Japanese system. Galveston system is clear water, and Japanese system is fertilized system or green water. That means, in Japanese system, you are putting everything together in one tank. You are putting your larva, you are putting your uh, larval feed, that is your roti or uh, your um, green algae, you know, chlorella and all those things are putting in one tank, one single large tank system that is Japanese system. But Galveston, Galveston, Texas and USA, there is a smaller system, there are small, small tanks, uh, separate for larval rearing, separate for rearing of ketoceros and uh, separate for rearing of chlorella, for the artem uh, then separate for artemia, so it will be all separate, separate, it will all be clear water, no green water. So food and everything together, feed based system. Uh, means fertilized system that is green water and feeding system that means separately you are giving feed that is in the Galveston system. Uh, then uh, crabs have five zoyal stage, megalopa is the crab like appearance that is an important question there. Uh, then bivalves, freshwater bivalve stage is Glochidium that is in Unio and others all tropophore and isocrisis is the preferred feed for larva of bivalves. And uh, so all here these are uh, shrimp prawn and crab, uh, not prawn, Shrimp and crab you can uh, do by uh, eye stock ablation. You can increase their air maturation, it will go molting and it will um, breed. Okay, so eye stock ablation is important thing. It can be done by electro or uh, by pinching. Cauterization is a more um, healthier and a safer way to increase the brood stock size or um, brood stock uh, longevity also. Then sea cucumber, thermal stimulation is preferred. Uh, we know auricular area is slipper shaped, auricular area barrel shaped and pentagonal is cube shaped. Uh, so all that was all about the breeding and when we come to the culture, uh, there is something called heterogeneous individual growth. So heterogeneous means different, not all together. Homogeneous means all together same, heterogeneous means some people are different. So here it is seen in sea bars and freshwater ponds. So here order, among all the larva that we will have, some larva will be very smart. Okay, I will grow faster than you all and uh, that smarter growing, larger growing uh, larva will be called the shooters and the normal people that will be called as the laggards. So what happens is there is no problem, okay you growing faster, you grow, no problem for me. It's not like that. What happens is this faster growing fellow, it will start eating the smaller ones. So that is cannibalism will be increased, increased and eventually our uh, uh, production is less. No, We have less number of production in our hatchery. So we should be very careful, especially in sea bass, uh, by the time they open their mouth and start feeding, we should separate. So all the big ones separately in one tank, smaller ones separately in smaller tanks. Uh, in prawn, uh, this greatly affects the production in freshwater prawn. Uh, so you have to continuously, you have to look at your stock and you have to reduce them. Uh, in sea bass, you can wean them into artificial feed, then the cannibalism will be reduced. But in prawn, that is not possible. So prawn, you have to keep looking. And the uh, fastest growing prawn is called orange claw. And uh, the biggest is called the bull and it is the blue claw. And the smallest is called the runt and that is the small claw. So you do back stocking, you do pasture harvesting means, uh, uh, what is it, um, uh, um, more often you will harvest and you will separate the bigger ones. You will sell the bigger ones and let the smaller ones grow. So HIV is managed in uh, sea bass by grading and then weaning into artificial diets and in uh, prawn it is managed by uh, continuous harvesting or uh, batch harvesting. Then culture based capture fisheries, uh, so you have to know large reservoirs, medium reservoirs, small reservoirs. Uh, then uh, the pen culture suitable depth and for cage culture also. This is all fresh water that is the inland areas and uh, when you do for cage in uh, marine side, uh, there is a difference in the, you have to look at the uh, current also, the speed, you know, the speed of the wind speed also. So because of that and marine side more preferred is the circular cages. Uh, then this is about the introductions which affected the indigenous population of certain fishes. Then comes ornamental aquaculture. So you have to be very clear about which are non-adhesive eggs, semi-adhesive and uh, um, adhesive, um, adhesive and this is non-adhesive. Uh, so danios have non-adhesive eggs, 
and then goldfish as well. The goldfish is what it is a carp, common carp has an mix, so goldfish also has a mix. And then an important question is uh, which uh, ornamental fish will deposit eggs in another animal? So that is beetling rhodius, and then egg barrier is there. So this will bury its egg in the pond bottom, and when uh, in, in the summer the fish will die, and but the egg will be safe under the soil, and when the rain comes it will come out again. Then. Uh, so this is a uh, this one uh, best most important is Singapore and uh, most common freshwater fish is guppy followed by neon tetra and uh, then in marine side damsel fish is there clown fish is there it is done by Sima Fari has standardized their breeding and uh, Poma Centrida is more traded and marine side now only uh, breeding is being developed but marine is 98 percentage it is dependent on the um, wild caught only so 90 percent 98 percent is wild caught. And um, here's one thing, soft water, acidic water is preferred for a uh, discus angel and all. And then this is the Libera ratio for Libera fishes. Then we know discus feeds on mucus. And then building traps are used for Liberas because they will, uh, the, uh, the, what is it, the parent will start eating on the young ones. So then now we have the green certification that is for the uh, indigenous ornamental fishes that are traded. Um, so that is utilized device by MPEDA. And integrated fish farming. Um, so you know now integrated is um, is a developing area, or it was from earlier times also. It was there in China. They will say that one silver carp is enough to feed, uh, one grass carp is enough to feed two or three zooplankton feeders like the uh, silver carp. Uh, so similarly, uh, we have this um, this one now. Uh, how many number of cows you need for the production of three to four tons of fish and all? So you just remember this. 5 to 6 cows, 40 to 45 pigs. These are all for the production of 3 to 4 tons of fish per hectare per year. Uh, so sometimes they will ask 2 to 3 tons also. So in that case, uh, this is the number. Just remember this. And then Pokali fish culture is there. Uh, for Pokali rice, uh, Pokali means it is a salt resistant paddy. For that, you have to use uh, what is what preferred amount uh, type of rice is uh, used. Like if they ask, uh, it will be like you should not use the common one you should use the local ones as like patambi and like their varieties are there those varieties you have to use and not the exotic varieties and all and then suitable fishes if you are using for integrated fish farming it is omnivorous or herbivorous and then uh, coming to the cultural systems RAS is there in RAS what you should know is the flow no? first it is going to the suspended solids removal and then it is biofiltration then you have disinfection then finally you will aerate the water and you will release it to the culture tank so you will just remember this flow correctly and uh, then you have biofilter uh, in biofilter the major thing is this um, nitrogen oxidation that is a conversion of ammonia to nitrite and nitrite to nitrate so remember the bacteria which are involved in mixed up the most common one is nitrosomonas in the first step and nitrobacter in the second step uh, so this is just Mm, some additional bacteria which are involved. So all these bacteria are chemoautotrophs. Uh, and uh, when it comes to bioflock technology, there the organisms are heterotrophic organisms. And the bioflock, you need to maintain the carbon nitrogen ratio between uh, 1 is to 10 to 1 is to 20. And then uh, these are the this one, Clufa. Freshwater fishes have omega-6 and marine fishes are rich in omega-3 fatty acids. And you have to remember the names, linoleic acid is an omega-6, arachidonic acid is omega-6, and linolenic is an omega-3, and then DHA, EPA all are omega-3. So remember which is omega-3, which is omega-6. So, um, then you have your amino acids, essential and non-essential. Then limiting amino acids in fish is methionine, methionine and lysine. And uh, fish is a good source of everything except carbohydrate and vitamin C or ascorbic acid. Then coming to, uh, so AAS will be covered by someone else, but I just wanted to give you uh, something that I feel is very important. So difference between SPF, SPR and SPT. So SPF is specific pathogen free. Now we are listening, all good stock is specific pathogen free, Mononon is coming from Hawaii, uh, Vanami is coming from Hawaii, but what is the difference? So SPF means they will take the broodstock separately to some long different area away from all the other species and they will grow them separately there, give them food, everything is in a very much uh, controlled and biosecure facility. So that is SPF. And uh, so SPF if it comes out of that biosecure facility it will be called as a high health shrimp. 
then comes the SPR. So SPF, you have to be careful. There is nothing about the genetic about genetically. It is not tolerant to any disease. It is just free of disease. It just you think it took bath and now it is nicely clean. That's all. It is not having any inherent capacity to avoid any disease. Nothing like that. Okay, it is just good and clean root stock. It is. Then comes SPR, specific pathogen resistant. That means it is having an inherent capacity. Like I got chicken pox when I was small. Now I have an inherent capacity to uh, tolerate chicken pox. So like that, this SPR they were selectively bred. Like they are uh, they were selectively bred to tolerate the certain number of diseases that they are made to uh, tolerate. Uh, I mean to resist. So if that if we put them, if we put one enemy in a pond of uh, WSSV virus also, it will be resistant to it. Not literally. That much amount virus load will come. It might affect. I'm not sure. I'm just trying to give you a picture. It is resistant to it. Can fight with it. It will be resistant. And then tolerant means uh, it will get infected, but it will not show the symptoms. Means it will not die. It will. So white spot disease, if it is tolerant to that, it will not have the white spots. It will not. It will survive that. So that is specific pathogen tolerant. So what you have to remember is SPF is a, not a genetic characteristic, but SPR and SPT are genetic characteristics. Means they are selectively bred to tolerate and resist that particular pathogen. And then bioremediation. So bioremediation is a buzzword now. Everywhere you see, you can hear bioremediation. Not only in our field, uh, it is there in uh, environment management. That is like pollution control. Everywhere we have bioremediation. So I think our examiners are also looking towards bioremediation. So we should go with the flow. We should be in terms with the times. Uh, so we have bio types of bioremediation. So bio stimulation means uh, bioremediation means what you are using biological organisms to uh, treat some problem that we have. Means waste management. So biostimulation means what you'll do. You are using bacteria, okay? But this bacteria is not having enough nutrients in that waste environment. It is not enough for it. It is not growing. Hey, I don't like this food. I'm not growing. So you will give it food. What food it needs, you will give it stimulation. See, I will give you this biscuit. You please clean this uh, waste. No, I will give you this. Like that, we are telling that is biostimulation. Then bio augmentation. Augmentation means uh, like I am a single person, single bacteria. I am going to clean up one big. Uh, Pile of waste, no, I alone can't do. So I need some extra help with me. So that is called bio augmentation. You are adding other organisms, supporter organisms with me. So like Chanakya is there. He is singly. He is working. He was working. So he is only from. Uh, he can work on FRM or AEM. So he need more help. So he called all of us. So we are biologically augmenting to his uh, contribution to all of us. So that is bio augmentation. Then bio venting. Uh, so venting means. Uh, there is some your uh, there is a region there we don't know if there is a organism but we hope that whatever soil it is there should be some indigenous microbes there no so you will give it some air and tell them to revive get up and start doing your work so that is called as bio venting and uh, bio sparging means along with this air you will also give them some nutrients if you feel that okay maybe there is some uh, reduction in some amount of nutrients in that uh, area so we'll give some nutrients also that is called bio sparging then. Uh, there is one more thing, phytoremediation. I will go back to the previous slide. Uh, bioremediation means we are using biological organisms and phytoremediation means we are using plants. Uh, so plants are used to uh, remove this um, waste or um, polluted uh, water and all. Uh, and uh, so we have constructed wetlands and all and Iconia can remove heavy metals. That is an important thing in this aspect. And um, so here also we have some types. So, that is like the first one is phytodegradation or phytotransformation. Means this plant will, that's like the general definition. The plant will take that uh, uh, that um, dangerous particle or chemical what is there and it will convert it. It will not be visible anywhere. It will be gone. So that is known as a phytodegradation or phytotransformation. Phytovolatilization is it will take up the dangerous component of that uh, chemical and it will convert it into a less toxic form and make it into volatile and it will be released as a gas. Volatile means what it will be gone, na? it will be like uh, released as a gas into the atmosphere. So that is phytovolatilization. So emitted from above ground. That is the key word that you are looking for. If that is there, that is phytovolatilization. Then phyto extraction. So extraction means the plant will extract all these toxic heavy metals. So Iconia will do phyto extraction. And uh, we don't know where it is going, but it is extracted by the Iconia and it will be kept inside there. Mm, then phyto stimulation means what? There also we learn stimulation. Na? So stimulation means what you are just stimulating the organism to do their work. So this plant uh, uh, plant root uh, has a good atmosphere that will help for the organisms to grow. 
then phyto stabilization stabilize means what to stabilize to have a stabilized career means you have a good job and you have you are in one place you are not jumping from here and there you are in one fixed place so that is called as stabilization so that is the elimination of bioavailability that means uh, that heavy metal will not move it is fixed you stay here that's all using the movement elimination of bioavailability so all these are phyto stabilization then rise of filtration rise of means what root filtration means what filtration so using the plant roots to remove some uh, chemical that is called as rise of filtration then we have inta inta means integrated multitrophic aquaculture so father of inta is a scientist from canada his name is thierry chopin uh, it's not a significant thing so let him mention it here Uh, so inta basis is you have the fed species so you just have to know what is fed species which is extractive species which is organic extractive which is inorganic extractive bus so fed species is our fish the main culture component so that is mostly in the world it is salmon nowadays mm, that is a thing uh, then we have extractive we have organic extractive suspension feeders are there in that organic will be taken by the shellfish that is our mussels and inorganic will be taken by the seaweeds inorganic means phosphorus and nitrogen as such it will be taken by the seaweeds okay that is mostly kelp in the case of atlantic salmon inta then deposit the excess feed and all as such what we do is just coming it will be deposited that will be taken by the uh, like um, sea cucumber or uh, uh, crabs and shrimp all this will be the deposit extractive aquaculture species so we have deposit extractive uh fed species is fish deposit extractive is um, invertebrates like a sea cucumber or shrimp or crab then organic extractive suspension wala is uh, shellfish that is like mussels and inorganic is uh, seaweeds and this um, this is something uh, this is something that i get confused always and um, samyadi has mentioned i'm not sure so this is triploidy triploidy is done um, by prevention of Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. As I have said uh, in my introduction, that uh, Zain, ma'am, she is uh, highly professional. She is uh, very confident. Uh, she has presented each and every uh, concept and agriculture concept, uh, all the relevant concepts in exam point of view, uh, starting from uh, the data, uh, the production data, the legislation, the conservation, the water quality, uh, the larval stages, ornamental, integrated fish farming, biofilter, IMTA. She even covered genetics, AM, uh, bioremediation. 
so we could see how much effort uh, she has put in creating all these uh, really organized presentation it's always enjoyable uh, to listen to her uh, means she always brings some innovative effective uh, highly organized talks to the table so we thoroughly enjoyed uh, and learned many things ma'am and uh, hopefully uh, is uh, if there are any questions uh, we will deal the questions we will answer the questions we will try to answer the questions i think there are no questions ma'am am, am i audible yes yes you are audible okay uh, it seems there is no question only one question was there uh, from sagar i i can't see the question because i, uh, I just joined so ma'am can 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 you one answer sagar's question yeah i think that was about that uh, tilapia gift tilapia growth percentage right sagar Thank you. 